Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've known Kelly since she was 12 years old. She was six foot one at 12. I have three daughters. My oldest daughter played competitive volleyball on a club team, and the club teams, hers and Kelly's, would compete with one another. She was a super athlete back then, and she was a super athlete when she was at USC, taking USC to the Final Four in volleyball. The reason why we're having this press conference is because a submitted complaint was leaked yesterday, and we got deluge with calls from different media outlets. But we could not talk to you about it or comment about the complaint until we received an assigned case number. We just got that about an hour and a half ago, and I'm glad you folks were able to show up, and we appreciate that. Now, after I'm done with my little introduction, Kelly's going to speak, and she's going to give you her statement. She's only going to talk about Walton and what he did to her, as alleged in our complaint. Everything she's going to talk about is going to deal with him. All the legal stuff, all the prayers for damages and such, I'll deal with that if you have questions about it. It's not her bailiwick necessarily. At the time of the 2014 event, Kelly was only 25 years old. Some wonder why she waited so long. She had just gotten a job with Time Warner, and she'd been on that job for less than a year when this incident occurred, as we've alleged in our complaint. She didn't go public. It took her a while before she was ready to go public, and she's now ready to go public. After we're done with her statement, we're going to open it up for a few minutes for some questions that you folks might have. So, Kelly? I'm grateful for everyone being here today to hear me tell my story. Um, I am no longer comfortable staying silent about the things that have happened to me, and although this may come as a shock to many of you in this community, this is a reality that I have been living in for years, and I can no longer stand to not tell the story of what has profoundly affected my life in all of the events that we have alleged in our complaint. I met Luke Walton about 10 years ago at a volleyball tournament. I had known his wife for many years as we competed against each other playing volleyball. And during that time, would see them both at volleyball events throughout Los Angeles. And in 2013, Luke started working with me at Time Warner at the time while I was covering the Lakers and he became one of our analysts. And during this time, he became a mentor and a friend and someone that I looked up to. And I was writing a book about athletes transitioning out of sports and into the real world. And I felt that based on our conversations, he would be the candidate to write the forward for the book. And I asked him as my friend and colleague if he would be willing to do that, and he graciously agreed to do it. We met a few times over lunch to discuss what the forward would entail, what I needed, his thoughts on the book in general, to get his input. And I was very grateful to be able to spend this time and have him involved in a project that meant so much to me in my experience, as well as something that he was incredibly passionate about as well. Once the book came out, he was already with the Warriors. And as, as it came out, I decided I wanted to give the book to anyone that had contributed as a gift. And I reached out to him knowing that he would be in town with the Warriors to play the Lakers in Los Angeles. And I asked him if we could meet up so I could give him the book personally, and he agreed. He said I could swing by his hotel and drop it off. So I did that. I stopped by his hotel, and I had the book wrapped in gift wrapping. And as I pulled up to the hotel, he waited for me outside. I got out and handed him the book, and we hugged, and he was so excited about it and was so happy to see me and asked me 
to park my car, car across the street because we hadn't seen each other in quite a while. He wanted to catch up and hear how things were going with the book. I agreed. I parked my car across the street and as I walked into the hotel with him, I anticipated us walking into the lobby where we would hang out and catch up. And he started to walk towards the elevators. And I asked him where we were going. And he said, up to his room. And I asked him why we were going up to his room. And he said, because the players on his team were in the lobby and he could not be around them. He didn't want to be seen in the lobby with the players. So I was hesitant and he said, don't worry about it, it's me. And as someone that I trusted for a long time, I realized I shouldn't overthink it and follow his lead. I walked up to the hotel with him and continued to tell myself not to overthink it and that I could trust him. Out of nowhere, he got on top of me and pinned me down to the bed and held my arms down with all of his weight while he kissed my neck and my face and my chest. And as I kept asking him to please stop and to get off, he laughed at me. I continued to ask him to stop over and over again without any use of my arms because he continued to hold me down. I could feel him rubbing his erection on me. And he continued to laugh at all of my pleas to get off and to stop. I thought he was going to rape me. I finally was able to get up after what felt like forever. And I immediately jumped up to leave the room. And he came around and grabbed me from behind and again held my arms down so I could not move and started kissing my neck again. I kept begging him to please let go and to please stop and he continued to laugh in my ear. He finally let me go and I got out of the room. I was grateful that he was not in Los Angeles and that I wouldn't have to interact with him after this. But everything changed in 2016 when he joined the Lakers. I was on the board of a charity and putting together a charity event and it was my job to get Luke Walton as our guest honoree. When he showed up to the event, I walked out to his car to show him where to park. As soon as I walked up to the driver's side window, he looked me up and down slowly and started making noises saying, mm, you're killing me in that dress. And every feeling I had from that first experience of feeling disgusted and betrayed came back. He parked his car and walked in to the building with me. And right before we walked in, he hugged me and pressed his body against me and kissed me on the cheek. I felt disgusting. And I couldn't believe that he, knowing what he had already done to me, willingly touched me in that way. I had to moderate a panel with him and talk about how amazing he was for an hour. And it literally killed me inside. <clears throat> After that, I got promoted. I was now full-time covering the Lakers, which meant I had to go to practices and games weekly. So my interactions with him increased. And every time I showed up to practice or games, he would be sure to hug me and kiss me on the cheek in a scrum of this size with many people around. And I couldn't do anything. I pretended to be completely normal this entire time. And I felt like I had nowhere to turn. As I've talked about already, 
as we have alleged this complaint, every interaction with him that I had over that time made me incredibly uncomfortable and feel unsafe. This type of behavior cannot be condoned. And no woman should ever be made to feel like a victim. I appreciate you all being here today and I look forward to getting this off my chest and being able to heal and also hoping that he learns a lesson and knows that he can never do this again. All right, folks, um, we're going to take a few questions. Um, whoever is asking the question, please identify yourself, your name, and what outlet you're affiliated with. Speak loudly, and we'll take a few questions. Kelly. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's have hands up, and I'll call on people. Uh, go ahead, sir. Okay. Steve Feinberg with CBS News. I wanted to ask you a two-part question. Number one, I think we're all quite curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can um, you repeat a part of this question, maybe? Yeah, to, to the first part of your question about why I waited to come out, um, I understand that many of you probably are wondering the same thing, and I was scared. When someone assaults you and you think you're going to be raped, coming forward is a scary thing. And I have spent years now dealing with this, trying to forget about it, hoping that I could push it to the side and bury it, and hoping that time would heal. And that was not the case. And I feel like over this time, I was able to muster up the courage and have enough conversations with Garo where I felt comfortable to talk about this. I'm sorry, I forgot the rest of your question. You have a message. I'm yes. I'm sure you want to, would like to be a symbol of, of strength for, for women who dealt with similar situations. What would your message be? Um, my message to any woman who has been in this situation is one that I'm so sorry, and you should never be put in this situation to begin with. But I always believe that if sharing my story helps one woman feel heard or a little more safe or like she can say something as well, and it's always worth it. And this is a very important conversation for me to have for myself. And if it gives permission or a gateway for someone else to come forward and to know that they have a safe place to do so, then that's what matters to me. Thank you. Mr. Healy? Patrick Healy from NBC4. Um, Ms. Tennant, after that incident at, at the fundraiser, did you ever have the occasion where you have the courage to confront Luke Walton and, and tell him that how troubling this was to you and that he needed to mend his ways? Um, no, I never, I never talked to Luke about it. To what I said earlier, I was scared. And when someone that you trust so much, that you've known for so long, that you truly believe would never do anything like this to you, pins you down to a bed, holds you down with his whole body weight, and makes you think that he's going to rape you, the last thing that I was thinking about was how to come forward. I was scared for my job, my safety, and what my livelihood would be like. So it was when your job position changed, you no longer had to worry about those encounters? I'm sorry, what do you mean? When was your job position changed, so you were no longer with the Lakers during the season? That removed you from the situation? You mean I after know. I no longer worked at Spectrum? No, I think you mean when they were off season, no longer Lakers, did that? Well, maybe you can comment on how often you would see uh, Walton uh, once he became uh, associated with the Lakers. Yeah, and I, didn't, I wasn't full time with the Lakers when he first joined. I was working with other teams as well, so I wasn't there as much. When I got promoted is when I was being sent to practice on a weekly basis, so then my interactions increased. Before that, I didn't see him very often. So when did those frequent interactions finally end, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Um, well, I, I left my job at Spectrum in about a year ago. So, yeah. Oh, wait, I thought I... 
your um, name again, please. Leah Uko, the Fox 11. Um, I didn't have a question until now. I just want a clarification. You, um, you were both with your, your first job, and after that incident happened, you were relieved that you wouldn't have to see him anymore, but then he moved to LA with the Lakers. You were working part-time there. You had the, your main job was, and I'll get clarification for that in a moment, your main job was to get him to before I was, before I got promoted, yes, I was full time already. I was just working with other teams more extensively. When I took on the Lakers in a larger capacity, my role with other teams lessened. And then you got promoted, and you had to interact with them more. Correct. Yeah. All right, standing over there, I think from the B. That's correct. Yeah, Benji both from the Sacramento B. Uh, what do you want to see from the Sacramento Kings and the NBA? You know, uh, we're going to talk about what Walton did to her and not what the Kings have to do or any other organization. So I'm sorry. I'm not going to have her comment on that. Uh, Tell me again, John, you were saying, um, in the lawsuit, you mentioned that there were people that, even though you didn't go public with this, there were people that you told. If you're not comfortable saying exactly who they were, what kind can you kind of characterize who you told at the time? Well, let me just answer that question real quickly. She told her immediate family, and beyond that, uh, we're not going to comment on, but she did tell her immediate family. Did she ever tell Spectrum? Uh, no. And uh, again, we want to talk about what Walton did and not the other frivolous stuff, if we could. Uh, yes? Pete, number three, okay, in XN70. I understand the concerns you had about your career, your job, and everything else. But did it ever occur to you at one point or another when you were going to be in close interaction with this man that you already were? fear of, why you didn't go to someone like HR, or why didn't you go to someone that you trusted in law enforcement and said, I've got a problem here? As Garo mentioned earlier, I was 25 when this first happened, and as a young woman who had only been in this job for less than a year, that was incredibly grateful for where I was and had worked incredibly hard to get to that point, I was scared, and I felt coming forward would jeopardize every aspect of my life. Sure. Okay, we're just going to take a couple more questions uh, here. Rob Hayes with Channel 7. Uh, can you just go through the, the, the timeline of this? I'm trying to put that all together in my head. So you, when was the book published? When did you uh, meet Walton at the hotel? We can give you those approximate dates. Uh, so early 2014 for the book, or mid, and then later in 2014, the meeting at the hotel. And then 2017 was a charity event. I uh, hope that helps. And 2013 was when you began that job. Um, Sorry. Yeah. I do have a question. Leah Uko with Fox 11. Do you think that um, this could, do you think that this could possibly shine light on how a lot of victims, alleged victims of sexual assault, don't know what to do when things like this happen? Because um, every time a story like this comes out, that is always the question. And this is always the response, you were scared. Do you think, I mean, is there any message that you could give to you about what people should do, even if they're scared, what's the next step? It's a great question. And I don't know that I have a perfect answer for it. I think having more conversations like this and more women who come forward and talk about what they've been through is really important because I think so many of us feel silenced and feel this burden and not wanting to lose everything we've worked so hard for. And yes, telling someone that you trust and being able to go to your HR I think is super important. I don't think that every person has that ability and I don't think every person feels that kind of protection. And this is why we are in a state where this is such an often conversation we are having now. Um, I see one more hand. Chris Wolf, well, ATLA 5 News. This is a question for you, sir. Why no police report now? Why no pursuit of a criminal case? Is there a statute of limitations on criminal charges? Can you explain that? You know, our interest is not to uh, have Mr. Walton put in jail or to be investigated by the police necessarily. Uh, our interest was for Kelly to feel better about herself, to come out and talk about what happened to her, and that's what she's asked us to do, and that's why we went ahead with this complaint, and 
we want to stay within the four corners of the complaint as we've alleged certain at conduct by Mr. Walton. As far as going to the police, you've heard her describe why she didn't do it back then. And more often than not, if you go to the police a few years later, uh, it's very difficult to put together a case where you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The standard of care is much higher. And so uh, the police departments are not very likely to uh, get involved in a case this old at this time. And uh, we prefer to, uh, you know, we purposely didn't name uh, his wife or any other member of his family in our complaint. I know the media somehow got a, they had information and published it. We are really uh, uh, not happy about that because I don't think anyone else should be involved in this. It was Walton that did this, and Walton needs to learn not to do this ever again. Can you talk about damages that you're seeking? Yeah, the, the, the complaint, which I will be happy to uh, share with you, uh, just has a whole litany of things that we are entitled to under the law, and one of them is punitive damages, exemplary damages, uh, and that basically goes to deter the individual from doing this again. And part of that, of course, is also damages that deal with what she's gone through. And in terms of us asking for some, we don't have any sum in mind. In the end, we'll be able to present this case to a judge and a jury, and we'll let the jury decide what, if any amount, she deserves in fair compensation. In the back there, we're just going to do two more questions. Sure. Uh, Tom White with CBS2 and Hotel. Uh, just along the lines of Chris's question about the police report, I think the crime was committed, and the allegations seem very credible, obviously. Why is it incumbent upon you to, to file that report if you're going to do this in a civil court? Why not in a criminal court if the law is appropriate? All right. Um, I'll just give you a, I guess maybe I won't give you the anecdote. Uh, I had my car stolen and they wouldn't take a report over the phone. I had to go down, try to make a report. I waited a long time. I knew exactly where my car was, told the police department where it is. They knew where it was for seven hours, five minutes from the police station. They had so many other crimes to solve. They said, sorry, we're not going to drive five minutes to pick up your car because we had you know, GPS coordinates, we knew exactly where it was. So the police department's real busy with crimes being committed now. You go to them and tell them there was a crime committed a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, they just, you know, they're too busy. Uh, and, and I'm sorry to tell you. Hold it. That may have cut five years ago. Harvey Weinstein, everything else happening right now, they're talking about cases going back 10, 15 years. At that argument, that doesn't apply anymore. You've got the DA, you've got LAPD, RHD, Rape Special doing this. Why not give it to them? They have the ability to go back and they show a willingness to Okay, I haven't said that I'm closing the door on that uh, right now. So now that you folks are bringing it up and hammering us over the head with it, we'll consider it. And that doesn't mean we're taking it off the table. It doesn't mean we're going to go to the police tomorrow. Maybe we'll be contacted by the police department that watches or listens or hears about this and wants to investigate this. We know the NBA is going to investigate this. And so we'll see where this takes us. Carl, handicap Jay Kinsey. Is there any evidence of any kind? Photos, videos? Um, I'm not going to answer that question. I think uh, when these things happen, you don't have cameras rolling. You don't stop taking photos. This was not in a public location. so to suggest evidence. Evidence is what witnesses say they heard, saw, touched, felt. That's evidence. You don't necessarily have to have pictures and documentary evidence to prove your case. So evidence is the believability of a witness. You've heard Kelly, and I'm sure we'll hear from Mr. Walton. Was she physically injured? No, we're not alleging any physical injury per se in terms of physical assault, yes. Injury, now you get into a, you know, the question of were there bruises, were there cuts, you know, were there sprains, and no, no, we're not alleging those uh, in terms of a physical injury. And when you look at our complaint, we're staying within those four corners of what we've alleged in the complaint here today. And I'm going to take one more Your question. Honor, can I ask you, you briefly touched on uh, Kelly, talk to her immediate family, without giving any names, can you tell us 
were there people outside her family? Because uh, those witnesses can sometimes be challenged in court. But are there other witnesses, maybe friends of hers, who she contemporaneously did inform of this without giving us those names? Very well. I'll just answer the question this way, that there were um, a few people that she communicated with that were very close to her. Um, and that's all I can say no, because I've got to again stay within the four corners. But my only question was: Are any of these people beyond blood relatives? That's all I want. The answer is yes, okay. and we'll get to that when the time comes. Are any photos of any bruises at all? There are no photos of bruises, no videos of the incident. I imagine if somebody went back and uh, looked at the security videos, you would see her in the lobby and that kind of thing, but we have not attempted to secure the, that information. I don't think that necessarily proves much, but we'll soon be asked. Kelly, did Mr. Walton, when you were in the hotel room, and I apologize to ask you to be with us again, was there ever an offer of alcohol or anything, and did he seem in a unusual state since this was somebody that you had encountered and had many conversations during this time? Yeah, we're going to stay within the four corners of the complaint. Any discussion about things that happened um, that may offer a little more information to you folks. If it's not in a complaint, we're not going to discuss those now. So was there alcohol? Change? And uh, we're not going to answer that now. I can tell you that nobody drank any alcohol that we know of. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Do you forgive Mr. Walton? Uh, I'm not going to ever answer that question because I think uh, forgiveness uh, is something that we all do at the right time, and uh, I think sometimes an apology uh, is, needs to be for, forthcoming before uh, forgiveness is expressed, whether one feels it inside or not. An apology should be forthcoming. So is an apo would an apology suffice? In an this apology situation? would go a long, long way. All right, with that, while you folks have heard some quotes and seen some quotes from his attorney and we're not going to get into a, a communication that's not civil. Thank you everyone.